Good morning, everyone. This is Valerie Edgeworth again at KDLA. We're going to go ahead and get started this morning. We are here for Anxiety Awareness. With me today is Zach Culver from the Kentucky Employees Assistance Program. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Zach at this point. We'll get started. All right. Good morning, everybody. And this is, like Valerie said, is Zach. And um, we're just going to jump right into this information. It's a lot of stuff. It's a two hour workshop that we've uh, distilled down into about 50 minutes so um, if you have any questions please feel free to chat them in but I will wait until we get through all our stuff including Valerie's before um, I address any of those questions but I'm happy to wait around um, after the hours up to, to discuss anything and then you'll also have our contact information at employee assistance uh, for any follow-up questions that you might have you can either reach me by email or call us directly all right Let's just start off with some um, some data, some information, some stats to get you kind of oriented to the face of anxiety here in the United States. Anywhere between, estimate is anywhere between 16 to 19 million people suffer from some type of anxiety disorder. And when you look at the presentation of anxiety disorders um, compared to the rest of mental health related issues, anxiety disorders is the most common mental illness in the United States. Um, 26 million people will experience some type of anxiety disorder problem in the course of their lives and we're looking at a price tag of about 42 billion dollars a year. Um, that's almost a oops, that's almost a third of um, the 148 billion dollar price tag for mental health um, related costs here in the United States today. And, and that looks at um, costs associated with repeated use of healthcare services, um, you know, treatment, uh, loss of time from work. Uh, the healthcare service piece is, is larger in anxiety disorders than in others because many of the symptoms of anxiety look like um, they take a physical nature to them and people that are diagnosed or get a little sense early on that anxiety may be their issue often are clued into that in doctor's offices and emergency rooms um, because they are presenting for issues related to physical stuff and once those physical things are ruled out what's left is anxiety. So where does anxiety come from? I mean why why do we have it? And the thing is is that anxiety is actually a necessary um, basically feedback, a necessary feedback that our brain and body need in order to kind of reorient itself to our situation and also provide us with motivation. Um, uh, there is a certain amount of spike in uh, focus and other biological processes that help us to kind of step to a challenge and anxiety in appropriate levels is actually very helpful. What you're seeing here on the screen is a breakdown of data based off of a, um, a research done in uh, um, the 1960s um, by two researchers named Yerkes and Dodson. And what they did was they took participants, uh, had them fill out a questionnaire looking to assess their level of stress and anxiety and then had them all perform the same task afterwards. And what you're seeing is the breakdown of their um, their performance and as you can see in the moderate levels here in the center get our, our pointer. Where is that pointer? Oh, it's all over here. That's weird. Oh. Oh, do you get it? Yeah, see, it's right there. In our, oh, it won't let you move it. Okay. That's yeah, that's all right. Well, anyway, the top of the, the the pointer showed up. It's just like off screen. I can't grab it. Um, so the the peak here. Oh, there it is. Thanks. You're welcome. Yay! Yay. The peak here <laughs> of uh, uh, of this graph is moderate levels of anxiety, and as you can see, based off of the um, the vertical axis, our performance is at the highest. But as we start to go to lower levels 
of anxiety and tension, you're seeing a fall off in performance level. And that's just this notion that, you know, if we are, you know, going to a job interview and we're not nervous about it a little bit, then we may not, you know, have our clothes ready to go the next morning. We may not make sure that our resume is up to date. We may not have reviewed questions that possibly could be asked. And that whole that whole desire or push to prep kind of goes out the window. Now, what happens when it starts to go towards higher levels of um, anxiety and tension? Well, now we're getting into the what the quote unquote diagnosable anxiety is, where the anxiety becomes so significant that um, we focus more on the physical symptoms or the worry, and it starts to have a negative impact on our ability to function. Um, and that's where, you know, you see these mental health diagnoses as far as anxiety is concerned, um, which we'll talk about here at the end when we talk about specific mental health diagnoses. Okay. So, as psychologists, we need... Um, uh, to operationally define everything. Um, you know, we need to know what it is that we're studying. And you know, there's a differentiation between anxiety and fear. Um, because fear, that is where anxiety and its, ne its necessity for self-preservation really is becomes crystal clear. So having an immediate response to a physical threat allows, well not allows, but forces the body to react in a way in which it protects itself by either running the other direction or turning around and fighting. And this is referred to, which you may be familiar with, the, the term fight or flight. So that's, you know, that's you know, somebody's coming at you. You need to figure out how to run, get away, or find something to defend yourself. Now, anxiety is looked at as more vague um, and related to the what-ifs. What's going to happen in the future? So worry, stress related to if I lose my job or if I become ill. So the difference here where fear is immediate, it's right there in front of you, it's something that you could touch. Where anxiety is, this hasn't happened yet, but I am reacting as if it has, and the physical symptoms that come with that. And a lot of the um, anxiety disorders we'll talk about, um, a good portion of them, have more to do with this future-oriented aspect to fear and anxiety. And, you know, the way animals are set up, you know, you take a turtle, uh, you know, you maybe you go for a jog on the same track out in the woods every day. You see the same turtle every day. As soon as you come up on that turtle, what happens? It sucks right in to the shell. Because it's not really considering whether or not, oh, I've seen this guy a couple times. He hasn't bothered me. He's not a threat. The turtle doesn't care about that. It sees you. It reacts. It's not going to have this internal conversation about whether or not you, know, you may you know, uh, be okay because we've seen you a bunch of times, you look pretty safe, blah, blah, blah. Where human beings, we have um, you know, these existential kind of conversations with ourselves, you know, what, what's the meaning of life and you know, am I doing jobs that um, fulfill me and you know, what if I end up on my deathbed deciding I didn't, you know, all that stuff actually starts to uh, result in physical symptoms that start to look like the fear response, even though this isn't something that's happening right now. And those types of reactions, that fight or flight reaction, is a part of the brain that's very old, very deep down, very close to other areas of the, of the brain that... Um, um, take care of involuntary processes like breathing, a heart rate, things that occur when you go to, sleep tonight, go to sleep at night. You don't have to put conscious effort into that stuff. It occurs on its own. Um, but you do have influence over it. You can slow your heart rate down through relaxation and breathing types of things. You can, um, uh, you can slow your breathing down. 
consciously. But when these when these processes occur, when this fight or flight system goes into play, uh, and and you know this is part of the autonomic nervous system, auto meaning you know involuntary happening on its own. Um, these are the types of things that you see when a person's fight or flight system jumps into play. So the dilation of pupils allows more light in so that you see better detail. Uh, maybe a, 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 the best place to hide or uh, the weapon on the ground that's going to help defend you the best. The accelerated heart rate allows more blood to flow to your muscles. Um, the muscle tension is that your body's basically kind of coiling like a string ready to jump into action. The rapid breathing allows for more oxygen to your brain and to your muscles. And then sweating is, you know, the body's natural air conditioner. It's also very difficult to grab someone when they're sweating. And then the suspension of digestive activity, that's just your brain saying, you know, right now, um, that digesting breakfast really isn't a priority, so we're going to, you know, put all our processes towards other things. And then the voiding of the bladder and the bowels is just to lighten the load so that just, well, there's less to, to, to have to carry when you're running away. And often people with issues related to anxiety will complain of stomach cramps or stomach issues, and that's part of this, um, this process in the digestive tract. Okay. So, you know, if you think about going out, um, maybe you've had dinner with friends, you've, you know, uh, been out later in the evening, uh, you decide it's time to go, it's, you're on your own, you're walking back to your car, you're walking through an alley, and all of a sudden you hear a noise move behind you. You know, what's your body going to do? You know, it's, you're going to maybe start to shake a little bit, your breathing will, will go up, your heart rate will, and this is that spike. And again, there is maybe hardly any, there may, may not be anything behind you that made that noise. There may be a cat running around, but you're, automa you're automatically, your fight or flight has jumped to the conclusion that a threat may be present, and your body reacts without you even having to think about it. And this brings us to the point of thinking and how it affects the way that you feel. Um, I mean, that is really the foundation of counseling and psychology. And the way that we appraise our situation, interpret what's going on in our environment, can have a direct impact on what our body does physically. And you see that the most in anxiety disorders. In fact, that's the reason I got into psychology, was this link between the brain and the body. But, you know, all throughout, you know, this is not a new concept, all throughout history, as you can see from these quotes on the screen, you know, the idea of the way that you think about your world has an impact on the way that you feel. And by changing those things, that's what a counselor works with a person to do. Okay. So why that... Why that transition from, you know, we talked before about making the differentiation between the term fear and anxiety. Why did that even need to be a conversation in psychology? Well, you know, if thinking affects the way that you feel, and if the possibility of something occurring is actually causing us to react, then this future-oriented concern is something that has to be discussed when a person comes to counseling. You know, the fact that anxiety disorders are the most diagnosed in the United States is interesting because among industrialized nations, among wealthy nations, it is the safest time to be living. There are less murders, there are less wars, there's less disease than any time in our history. But we are now the most anxious that we've ever been. So we don't have to worry about being, well, for the most part, don't have to be worried about being mauled by a bear. Um, we don't have to be worried about, for the most part, being gunned down in the street like in the Old West, which happened, you know, on a, on a frequent basis. But we are more worried about the what-ifs and this anticipatory anxiety. Um, and, you know, by identifying the things that kind of trigger that future-oriented thinking, that is 
the beginning spot for counseling for those that are going and seeking out treatment. So what I mean, why why do you think is it? I mean, why have we made that transition to be so worried about things when there's no actual immediate threat like you see with fear? I don't know. It's almost like there's a a magic 24-hour window out there where all the horrific events in the world can just, you know, pop right up and get to it whenever we want. We can stare at all the terrible things that are happening on the planet till we end up finding ourselves curled into the fetal position and refusing to go back out into the world. Um, luckily, there's nothing like that in our society, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, the thing is, is our brain often is, is not our friend. And even though the fight or flight response is so beneficial for self-preservation when there is immediate threat, the fact that it overwhelms us for things that have not occurred can really be debilitating. Um, you know, most people are uncomfortable in parking garages, and I bet the majority of us, especially if we're alone, would walk just a bit faster if it was nighttime, um, no one was with us, accompanying us, accompanying us. Um, you know, if we found ourselves in one of these situations. Now, if you've been actually assaulted in a parking garage, that's understandable. It's your brain dealing with the trauma and, and trying to remove itself from uh, a continued threat. But most of us have not. But we feel anxious just the same because of hearing reports of people uh, that has occurred or seeing it on the news or in movies. You know, movies often bad things happen in parking garages. So we start to associate uh, you know, these triggers for things that have not even occurred to us in particular. And this is an interesting concept because this will pop up again when we talk about post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, but these types of things haven't even occurred and we are now having a physical reaction to the idea of an attacker um, that then we associate with this garage. So there's a lot of leaps that the brain is making and again the way that you think affects the way that you feel. And this idea of you know now am I going to lose my job and not have income to care you know to take care of my family and myself. You know, Will I become ill and not be able to enjoy my life? Will there be people at work that you know, talk about me behind my back or work against me? Uh, you know, again, we're moving away from, you know, we've got all this psychic energy, this, this, uh, this physiological arousal that comes with stress and tension, and instead of having an immediate physical threat to put it on, we're now kind of moving that over to these future-oriented anxieties. Okay. So um, there are reasons that some of us are a little bit more susceptible to anxiety than others, uh, and that helps us better understand anxiety disorders. Uh, reasons for why different symptoms occur are vital, uh, especially for a therapist in understanding how to treat a person with anxiety, um, as you'll see when we discuss specific disorders. But there are kind of two things to look at when we're talking about anxiety. They go across the board whether or not somebody's more susceptible than others. Uh, but definitely a person who goes through some sort of traumatic occurrence. Um, because then, you know, we generalize that to other things and then we become scared of those things. Now, obviously burning yourself on a stove reminds you not to put your hand on the stove ever again. And our brain automatically makes that association with the pain and the resulting burn that comes with it. And that's, you know, that sticks in our brain pretty well. But then sometimes we might generalize it to other things, like anything that's circular and red um, or anything that's hot, uh, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. But when it becomes too generalized, then we really start seeing it impact a person's ability to function and live their lives. So, you know, if you almost drowned in a pool, you know, where you, you, know, you get a cramp, you fall under, you get saved, but that experience itself then makes it difficult for you to be around water in any situation. Pools, bathtubs, oceans, things like that, and you avoid that. 
Or let's say you're on a ladder and you fall, and then next thing you know, you'd never been scared of heights before, but now you're completely avoidant of going in any long, tall buildings or you know, going anywhere that's a, a high spot for you. And that also uh, can, can decrease your, uh, your, your ability to live your life because now your world's starting to shrink. And that's a really good way of kind of looking at anxiety, is that when anxiety becomes intense, your world gets smaller and smaller. Now there are also, in addition to learned events, there's also biological causes, predispositions, genetic predispositions in which a person is more sensitive to fear and worry. And the thing is, is that we all know that we're going to have something bad occur. I mean, that's not life. Um, we all do recognize on some very basic level that we will all die, but most of us don't sit and ruminate about it, where some people that suffer from anxiety disorders do. And there's just that, that predisposition to have that be more of something that just, you know, sticks in their mind that they return to on a more regular basis and also have more of a physiological reaction to it. Okay. Um, before we get to the specific disorders, I want to look at some unrealistic ways of looking at life. Um, that many people who suffer from anxiety use frequently. Now these are what we refer to, as you see on the screen, we call them cognitive distortions. Distortions just as a, uh, an error in thinking. Um, and often uh, cognitive behavioral therapists, which is what I am, and this is again the cognitive, is the thinking, behavioral is the actions that you take and how those two interact with each other. Cognitive behavioral therapists will often review these types of errors in thinking because it is beneficial for a person dealing with mental health related issues to, to really be able to identify those errors in thinking. And the thing is, is that you know, most of us have done these things. I know I have. Um, so it's not like only people with anxiety disorders or depressive disorders have thought this way. But it's when they become automatic. It's when they happen um, and we're not even aware of them, that it really starts to have an impact on the way that we feel. Because again, you hear me say it over and over again, thinking affects the way that we feel. So this all or nothing approach to things, uh, kind of black or white, you're evaluating events or your own personal qualities in terms of you know, black or white categories. I'm a good employer, I'm a bad employee. I'm a good husband, I'm a bad husband. Instead of being more specific about the things that everybody can improve on, because we're not perfect, um, you just you know do this in one way or the other, good or bad, and that's just not a really good way of looking at life. You know, looking at things in one way or the other um, that completely disregards the gray areas uh, in things. Overgeneralization, changing one negative event into an endless pattern of misfortune and defeat. Catastrophizing, taking a, a small personal fall or bad experience and turning it into something major. This is the idea of just making the, the mountain out of the molehill. Uh, minimizing, uh, putting down your own personal strengths and abilities, and often magnifying those around you uh, by making comparisons. You know, you get a, uh, your boss comes and says, hey, you did really great on that report that you sent in. And you say, yeah, you know, I got lucky. And besides, the, the guy down the hall did most of the work. You know, it's a good example of minimizing and then maximizing someone else's or magnifying someone else's. Um, fortune telling, I mean, where you kind of talked about that, that really is one of the basics for anxiety. Making negative predictions and then convincing yourself it's a fact, even though it has not yet occurred. It's that what if thinking again. Mind reading, assuming that you know what other people are thinking and feeling with no evidence to support that. And you will see this pop up pretty frequently in relationship issues. And I don't care how long you've been with someone. Um, you may know them better than anybody else, but you cannot read their mind. And you will often find that there may be a kernel of truth to what it is that you're assuming, but there's also a lot of stuff going on that you're not aware of until that information is provided. Um, personalization, this is a big one. This happens actually a lot more with depression, but uh, you know, just taking responsibility for negative events, even things that are beyond your control. Uh, often that will show up. And then emotional reasoning. This is feelings is fact. Um, you know, I don't want to go out tonight. Why not? Well, I feel like something bad's going to happen. Well, that doesn't give you a whole lot of information. And again, that's more kind of that fortune telling in a way. 
And then mental filter, seeing only the negative, screening out the positive. And then labeling, so instead of acknowledging, acknowledging mistake, you label yourself or others negatively. And again, that's just a quick way to categorize. Um, my social psychology teacher used to always say the brain likes it easy. And this is a way the brain is making it easy by labeling. But the problem with labeling is, again, you're not getting any information by having these kind of global labels plopped on you. I'm a bad employee. Well, that doesn't tell you what you need to work on. It just makes you feel bad, it makes you anxious, it makes you worried about going into the job. Or instead, if you break down, well, I'm good with people, but I'm bad at report writing. Well, at least that gives you information on what it is that you need to change. Okay. So again, you know, once a person starts to have these, and that's the way the brain works, but going back to that notion of the brain liking it easy, you know, a lot of times, many of the cognitive processes that we engage in, if we do them enough, they just start happening automatically because then we don't have to think about it. Well, if we start to engage in these distortions on a level that's automatic, then we're going to have changes in our mood and the way that we feel. We're not even aware where they're coming from. Well, they're coming from these automatic distortions. And when they start to really impact our ability to focus, um, you know, to be able to uh, cope with the physical part that comes with anxiety, then it has an effect on our ability to do our job. Um, we won't be able to enjoy time with friends in our support network, which is a big thing for a lot of people. We, we need people. We're set up for that. Um, and if you can't enjoy your social network or can't utilize that, then that's going to cause more problems with anxiety and depression. And then also just our ability to enjoy our personal life. Um, you remember I talked before about anxiety being... Uh, looking at anxiety as a way of just uh, decreasing your life, making it smaller and smaller. And, you know, even though every mental health related illness has, you know, at least one different symptom, across the board, the symptom of impacting our ability to work, socialize, and relax, that those are the three things that show up in every mental health related uh, diagnosis. It has to impact our ability to function before it's considered mental illness. So again, much of a person's thinking becomes automatic over time with repeated presentations. And, you know, uh, I've kind of tried to drive this point home, but if you think about, um, you know, uh, driving a car at the same commute every day, you know, if you go to work the same way every morning, often it's an automatic process. You know, you don't think, oh, I'll put the keys in the ignition, turn it on, put it in reverse, step on the gas. You just do it. And you go the same route. And a lot of times we're drinking coffee or listening to the radio or we're talking on the phone. Um, and everything's automatic. And I can probably guarantee you there's at least one person uh, uh, listening today that has, you know, gotten their car, driven to, you know, gone on the way to work and realized it's a Saturday. And been like, oh, well, you know, I'm on automatic pilot. And that's, you know, a good indication of you know, that automatic thinking. And so when this translates not to just mechanical types of, you know, things like driving a car and relates more to how we interpret our world, especially if it's negative or anxious, then we're going to be looking at anxiety and depression. Okay. So... What are the reasons that somebody may have these distortions in thinking? How does it get to that point? Well, we already kind of touched on the learning part, right? So previous traumatic experiences um, with you know, some sort of negative situation. So if a person is bit by a dog, they may develop a fear of dogs. Um, you know, if someone's involved in a major accident, they may be terrified to get in a car. If you grew up in the 80s, you may be terrified of boy bands. You know, it's just, we generalize <laughs> after traumatic experiences. And then pre-existing conditions. We talked about that biological component. You know, we may be born with it. We may be, you know, this may be characteristics of our personality that's handed down um, through different generations. Things that we have inherited from our parents. Um... Things such as a chronic over-arousal. So a person that, and you've, you've 
probably could recognize this person or may have this experience yourself, but a person that's so restless that they just can't sit still. You know, they're always kind of vibrating. It's a person that doesn't look comfortable in their own skin. Um, that, that physiological over-arousal that kind of comes with anxiety and nervousness. Um, or we talked before about, you know, the knowledge that something always, you know, that we're going to experience, you know, uh, stressful events, that, that we're going that we're going to die, you know, that sense of uncontrollability. And often people that suffer from anxiety feel like they're a victim all the time to their environment. You know, we all know that things are going to happen, but again, we don't ruminate about it. Where those that suffer from anxiety tend to spend a lot of their time thinking about that stuff. And in fact, people that I've worked with anxiety in the past have told me that if they feel like they're not worrying, then they're doing themselves a disservice because they're not preparing themselves for when something bad happens. Usually my response to that is, well, last, tell me about the last bad thing that happened. Was it still awful? Did you still feel um, impacted by it? And often they say yes. So, you know, uh, I have a little bit of problem with this notion of being able to prepare for the worst because often it doesn't happen exactly as, how, we, how we see it. So, you know, building up how we feel about ourselves and our confidence, not working too much on specifics, just knowing that you're capable of handling things often maybe help to reduce that anxiety, build confidence and esteem. And then also, too, the high, there's a, some people are kind of born with a high level of focus on threat-related stimuli. This is kind of what I refer to as the kind of the Bourne uh, syndrome. Like, I don't know if you're familiar with the Jason Bourne movies, but it's... It was uh, about a guy who was a, uh, a a trained assassin who has amnesia and then over time starts to realize that he has all this training and all these skills. But, you know, Jason Bourne, every time he walks into the room, he already knows what all the exits are. He knows who's the threat. He knows what's the best thing to use as a weapon. And often people, when they walk into social situations or things that are out of their comfort zone, do that. They look for, they kind of hone in on the things that are possibly threats and they keep an eye on that stuff and that's an exhausting way to live um, because now you're not focusing on the possible goodness or things that you know open, you're not open-minded to the possibilities of anything happening, you're just more focused on the negative all the time and as a result your, your threat assessment, that circuitry in your brain becomes overstimulated and now it's looking for lots of things and seeing things maybe where even threats not there. And then upbringing. And even though I'm a psychologist, you know, I try to stay away from the idea that it's always our parents' fault. But when we do do assessments with people and get histories about their childhood, there is no doubt that there are particular events and settings that then end up translating into anxiety or depressive disorders in adulthood. And these have to be discussed. You know, first of all, abuse. And that's kind of self-explanatory. You know, a child who's developing their personality and their understanding of the world, you know, on a very basic level, we all know that parents take care of their kids. Well, when this goes the other direction, it definitely has an impact on a person's ability to relate to others and how they see their world as a threat. You know, you're in a position where you're relying on the person that's abusing you. It's very difficult to trust after that. Substance use. Um, often those that are uh, in the households with alcoholics or other chemical dependent people, you know, um, describe um, unstable environments, not knowing what type of person they're going to have from one moment to the next. And that type of variability, that type of um, inconsistency really makes a person uh, as an adult anxious about what they're getting from others and again kind of in, uh, increases their threat assessment especially related to relationships. Anxious parents, um, you know, overprotection, you know, not allowing a child to fall down and figure out how to pick themselves back up, doing everything for the child then often translates into an adult who's very dependent on others and sees the world as a place of terror. Um, often this can translate into becoming dependent on maybe unhealthy relationships, which also has their own, you know, has its own negative impacts as well. Being in a situation where the child 
almost has to take the role of the parent. Um, and frequently this will be a situation where it's a single parent household and the parent themselves maybe has a mental health related issue or a physical issue and all the responsibility falls on the child. Um, you know, often this can turn into um, an adult who's very accomplished, but it also is uh, an adult that feels like if they're not always taking care of everything, making sure all their ducks in a row, then um, you know, letting their guard down, then they're, you know, they're at risk for something, and that can be very anxiety provoking too. And then finally, just a lack of information about bodies and emotions. I threw Carrie up here because I don't know if you're familiar with this story, but uh, Carrie ends up having telekinetic powers when she reaches puberty um, and you know, kind of goes off the deep end because she's not informed about what's going on with her and it causes a lot of stress. And this is maybe an extreme example, but um, you know, not being told about what to expect from yourself, not normalizing experiences with anxiety uh, and stress because we already talked about stress being something that you need you know if a, a parent's not having conversations with their kids about those experiences giving them the language to be able to define it then that type of um, uh, that type of not understanding what's going on can result in a lot of anxiety as an adult now look just because someone's in any of these one or any of these types of scenarios does not mean that you're going to have an anxiety disorder. In fact, many people use those experiences to their advantage. But, you know, this has to be part of the discussion because, like I said before, we frequently see uh, these types of things pop up in those that do present for anxiety-related issues. So how do we change our thinking? Thinking affects the rate that you feel, so we need to work on altering the way that we see our reality or our environment. Um, you know, asking questions like, what are the chances of this happening? Often people that have, um, you know, emotions, those feelings as fact, I break it down as good, you know, as specific as possible. A good example would be somebody that doesn't leave their house because they're worried they're going to get murdered. Well, a lot of times I'll pull the murder rates in a particular area. I will then break it down, and if you look at those types of things, what you'll find is, is that often random murders are very small. We're talking like lottery numbers. Usually when something like murders occur, it's because it was drug-related or it was a crime of passion or, you know, they were in a place they weren't supposed to be. And, you know, you see, you know, the, the chances of that stuff really starting to diminish if you kind of unpack it all and really evaluate what's going on. And then the what-if thinking, well, what is the worst that can happen? And then start talking about what would you do if it occurred? Because the thing about anxiety is that not only are we avoiding the things that make us anxious, but often we're avoiding even having the internal dialogue about what I would do if it occurred to me, because it's just too anxiety-provoking. So actually going through the motions of saying, okay, well, this is what I have available to me. These are the things that I can do. This is what you know, I should feel confident in. And then where's the evidence? Because if we're using feelings as fact, then we need to actually find evidence for why we think something's going to occur. And often, the evidence is very slim. It's very slight. Now, one very structured way of going about doing this is something called a mood record. And this should be part of the packet that was sent out to you. And it's a mood record because you can use this not just for anxiety, but also depression. In this situation, obviously, we're looking at an anxiety-provoking situation. And in this one, it's I'm giving a toast at a wedding. And then I write down my mood. And then the severity of that mood on a scale of 1 to 10. Here, the person is at a 9, so very high. So then our first automatic thought, what got us to that spot to begin with, was, well, people are going to make fun of me if I mess up. If I'm standing in front of people, maybe I flub a line or a joke doesn't hit, and, you know, they make fun of me. And I believe that at 80%, you know, on a scale of 100% or more. You know, or well, I'm sorry, zero to 100 percent. I'm at an 80, so I believe that pretty pretty strongly. And then you go to our distortion list, which we talked about before. And in this one, it's catastrophizing. It's making the mountain out of the molehill. It's also fortune telling, if you think about it too. And often you'll see some overlap with distortions. But as long as you're able to label it and put it in that section, and then we're looking for evidence for because you know we recognize that there is a reason why you got to that spot. Um, you're not delusional. Uh, maybe one of the things that you thought about was, well, there's this guy here that doesn't like me. He's kind of a jerk, and maybe he's going to make a scene. But then this fourth uh, column, this is the more important one. I, you know, you've got to actually sit down and think about the evidence against. Uh, you've got to build an argument for why this possibly couldn't occur. 
And then obviously you want to then generate an alternative thought that helps you kind of change the way that you see the possibilities. So maybe people are going to be supportive because they know how difficult it is to get in front of someone and present. And then you ask yourself how much you believe that. Um, this person believes it 80%. And frequently I'll say, all right, we'll go back to your first automatic thought and where are you at now with that? And sometimes that percentage goes down. It may not be zero, but as long as we're seeing it down to 50 or 40, that's progress. So, and this is something you can use even if you don't suffer yourself from an anxiety disorder. You know, going through this process for areas that may stress you out a little bit more than others is still a good way of getting those thoughts out of your head, getting a little distance from it, and seeing, kind of breaking down the, the gears, the machinery behind how you think and how it makes you feel. Positive self-talk is always good as well. Often people, when I talk to about anxiety, with anxiety and, and issues related to confidence, have this running negative tape in their head. Um, if we can replace it with your own tape, or sometimes even a therapist will generate something that a, a client can listen to with this uh, ultimate goal of making a transition from the therapist's voice to their own voice. But you have to be precise. You know, vague descriptors of what it is when we talked about that labeling before, that doesn't help. Specific analysis of what needs to change then gives you kind of a, a roadmap for what it is you need to do to build your confidence. Progressive muscle relaxation is a good way of recognizing the difference between when you are relaxed and when you're tense because that's all feedback. That's all information to let you know, hey, maybe I'm stressed out and I need to do something about this. So going through the process of tensing particular areas of your body from your face to your shoulders to your abdomen to your legs to your feet and then releasing them tensing, releasing, and then noticing the difference between what it's like to be tense and what it's like to be relaxed. And by doing this over and over again, you really start to have more insight on what your body's telling you. And therapy, if anything, is about insight. Now, after you go through all the different areas of the body and get to the end, often that feels very good and you can feel relaxed at the end. And what I'll tell people is, you know, maybe after you've gone through this whole process, then um, uh, visualize something that's relaxing to you. You know, like a like a beach. You know, sitting on a on a shore. Close your eyes, and the thing is, is that you know you can't just drop on the ground and do progressive muscle relaxation every time you're tensed. You kind of want to do that behind closed doors, or people look at you funny. But if you go through this process and then take a minute to visualize something like this, for instance, over a long period of time, let's say five six months of doing this, you know, two or three times a day then your brain starts to associate that feeling of relaxation with your image and it will start to relax on its own. Uh, it's not as intense as going through the PMR, the progressive muscle relaxation, but it does give you some relief and this is a good way of doing that. Now I, I th threw this image up once very early on when I was doing my workshop and somebody was like, well I'm, I can't swim so that makes me anxious. <laughs> so here's, here's one a little bit further back from the water, a little bit more relaxing. This is, if you take anything from today, take away how important breathing is. Um, we've forgotten how to breathe when we're stressed out, when we're thinking about how to react to something, often we're holding our breath. And that is where the fight or flight response can really be kicking in. If, if we're not breathing, we're breathing fast, we're breathing from our chest, high breathing instead of that deep diaphragmatic breathing that comes from our stomach, comes from the bottom of our lungs, then a lot of times that fight or flight response goes off. It makes us look for threats in the environment and it just all turns circles into itself. You know, hyperventilation, quick breathing, it, it messes up our chemical systems in our body, constricts our blood vessels, we get less oxygen to our brain, it makes us dizzy, makes us feel anxious, and then everything just kind of self-perpetuates. So you want to make sure that you're using that muscle below your lungs and when you breathe, your whole stomach cavity kind of just uh, fills with air. And then you want to slow it down. And I always tell people to exhale a little bit longer than the inhale because what we're finding is that the exhale actually helps us drop down our, um, our heart rate, which then will turn off that fight or flight response. Symptoms of improper breathing you're seeing here on the screen. I already talked about the lightheadedness and dizzy, which comes from the less oxygen, uh, you know, the decrease in oxygen going to your brain. But here you see a lot of other things that people experience when they don't breathe properly. Um, and you know that can result in a lot of issues with anxiety. So let's wrap up here and talk about specific disorders. Panic disorder is a recurrent unexpected panic attack. 
resulting in concerns about physical health and or sanity. People feel like they're dying, like they're having a heart attack, or they feel like they're going crazy. Um, and often people with panic attacks present to emergency rooms because of these particular issues. Now, a panic attack is five or more of the symptoms you see here on the screen. And just because you have a panic attack doesn't mean you have panic disorder. In fact, the research uh, suggests that at least 60% of the population have had a panic attack in their lifetime. But what turns into panic disorder is if, again, remember about it affecting the way you live your life. If you change your life around the panic attack, if you don't leave your house because you're worried you'll have a panic attack in public, or you don't want to have to ask for help because you're having these experiences, or, or you're embarrassed by the notion that people can see that you're having a panic attack, that's when panic disorder comes into play, and something called agoraphobia, which is when a person just chooses not to leave their house because they don't want to have a panic attack uh, in a place that's not safe for them, it's not a safe environment. Um, these uh, uh, symptoms you see on the screen, do these look familiar at all? Well, these are the fight or flight symptoms and these are the improper breathing symptoms that we discussed before. And basically a panic attack is your fight or flight symptom on 1000. It's turned, the dial's turned up all the way. Um, so these things, you know, these things are part of that fight or flight symptom, but they've just gone crazy. And it's up to you to bring your breathing down, to relax your body as best as possible. And a therapist will work with a person that suffers from panic attack to really focus in on the breathing and the relaxation piece. Generalized anxiety disorder, this is excessive or uncontrollable worry about a mul multiple situations for more than six months. Uh, you may see panic attacks, but you don't have to have them. Often muscle tension, restlessness, and fatigue, uh, and, and, and poor sleep, mainly because a person is, has that physiological arousal and because of their worry and their rumination. But the thing about generalized anxiety disorder is the theory is is that you get to a worry, you are overwhelmed by it, so maybe you move to a different worry so you can stop worrying about the first one. And then you worry about the second one, and then that becomes too overwhelming, you don't know what to do with it, so then you jump to another worry. And the jumping to the next worry is actually a way to avoid the first worry. But as you can see, jumping from worry to worry to worry becomes excessive, multiple situations, and it becomes overwhelming. Social anxiety disorder, this is extreme fear or embarrassment of humiliate, humiliating oneself in public to the point that, again, you see that phrase, changing your behavior. Uh, some of the most um, uh, common scenarios are using the bathroom, public bathroom, eating in public, talking to people on the phone, signing your name in front of people. These are all evaluative things. You're worried about how people are evaluating you. And then, obviously, the biggest one is public speaking. Post-traumatic stress disorder. This is the experiencing of a traumatic event. And then, you know, we talked about the learned experiences in our brain saying, hey, I'm not going to put myself in that situation again. Post-traumatic stress disorder is that learning, again, turned up to a thousand. And, you know, you go through a... And the thing about PTSD is you don't have to have something traumatic happen to you directly. You could experience or witness someone else whose body... Uh, is in danger or who is violated, and that can be what triggers your post-traumatic stress disorder. But you're seeing things related to jumpiness and irritability, difficulties with sleep, that, that psychomotor agitation, that restlessness that we talked about. Um, because basically after PTSD, your threat assessment is on all the time and everything possibly can become a threat. And because the traumatic event is so traumatic, the way that we generalize it now almost generalizes the things that are only slightly related. So again, everything is a possible threat to you. And that's why post-traumatic stress disorder can be so debilitating. But the way that people often react to PTSD is the numbing of emotions and thoughts and feelings, which can work for the stressor and the trauma, but you can't just compartmentalize that. It then also translates in how you interact with other people and that then has a, a pretty significant impact on relationships and work and things like that. So again, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be something that happens directly to you, but it's something that you can witness, a traumatic event to someone else. And then there's obsessive compulsive disorder, and that's broken down into this idea of, oops, is obsessions. So um, those are categorized as 
um, obsessions of like anger or angry thoughts, so intrusive, disturbing thoughts um, uh, that I'm going to have an aggressive impulse. Some people are just worried that they're spontaneously going to punch somebody. Um, or of germs, contamination, uh, that's another big one. Uh, an intrusive thought about everything, having everything to be symmetrical. Everything has to be set a certain way. Um, or uh, of, of sexual content. Like, I can't leave the house because I'm convinced I'm going to grab someone inappropriately, even though you've never done that before. Um, and the compulsion is something that you do in order to reduce the distress of the obsession. So you have a compulsion to go through a process and sometimes, you know, they're, they make sense. Like I clean all the time because I'm worried about contamination or if you've seen As Good As It Gets, which is a scene here um, with Jack Nicholson, he had these things like he had a toe tapping thing that he had to do when he get out, got out of bed or he put his foot all, over on his slippers a couple times before he could put them on and leave. You know, where he couldn't step on a crack, things like that, because that would have something would happen bad in, in the long run. So sometimes the compulsions have nothing to do with the obsessions, uh, but somewhere along the line, the association would made was made that that's needed in order um, uh, to decrease the distress. And then finally, let's talk about specific phobias or specific types. This is an uh, intense fear of a specific object or situation that results in distress, panic attacks, and extreme changes in behavior. The first one is the blood injection type. So this is a fear of needles, fear of blood. Um, this is the natural environment type. So hydrophobia, which is a fear of water, is a good example of that one. There's the animal type, which is electrophobia. That's a fear of chickens, which is actually very common. Uh, fear of birds, because they're prehistoric. A situational type, everybody's probably heard of claustrophobia. And then finally, other types, things that don't fit in these other four. Another, a good example of that, would, and a common one, is uh, calorophobia, which is a fear of clowns. That's a very common phobia, although I'm not sure why anybody would be scared of clowns. So. All right. Other warning signs, things that you'll see kind of across the board that I've already discussed. Um, uh, issues with fatigue, because you're physiologically aroused, you're having those symptoms all the time, it's very difficult not to be exhausted by them. The constant worry, the constant increased heart rate, muscle tension, threat assessment always on high, usually causes issues with fatigue. Um, avoidance, I mean, that is the main reaction to anxiety disorders, taking ourselves out of the situation that distresses us. But unfortunately, that causes us to miss work, to miss social relationships, to miss everything. And the more avoidant we become, the smaller our world is. And then finally, substances. Um, alcohol in particular helps to kind of mute that physiological arousal that we talked about. Depre you know, alcohol is a depressant. It brings those functions down. And maybe that's a good kind of break for a person. Um, and other things like, um, you know, benzos, volumes, stuff like that helps to bring that physiological stress down a little bit so it's a little bit more manageable. But obviously those types of drugs have their negative impacts as well. So You want to rule out uh, um, breathing issues because uh, that can look like panic attacks. Uh, heart stuff, uh, that can uh, result in shortness of breath. Thyroid issues, hypothyroidism has that physiological, that restlessness, that jitteriness. Um, and then obviously migraines can make you feel, have that unreality feeling, um, have some issues with uh, your vision. Uh, rule that stuff out first. A lot of that stuff can kind of look like anxiety. Treatment options, we already talked about this stuff already. Cognitive behavioral therapy, identifying the thoughts, changing the way we, we go about things, and then engaging in stuff that we've been avoiding up until this point and building coping strategies to deal with that and to get out there. Um, exposing ourselves to the things that we fear so that our brain adjusts to it instead of avoiding it. Building up coping strategies, time management skills, organizational skills for those people that have generalized anxiety who feel like they don't have an answer for things so they move to the next anxiety provoking thing and then the next thing and the next thing. And then the processing of trauma which is the ex exposure to the event in an environment that's safe and building ways to deal with the physiological symptoms that come with it. And then obviously medications is a direction to go. All right. Well, I'm going to 
move on now and let Valerie do her stuff. But any questions that you have, go ahead and type them in, and I'll be happy to hit them when she's done. Hello, everyone. Just real quickly, I'm going to talk about a few of the resources and services here at the State Library that are relative to today's training on anxiety awareness. Here on the slide before you, you will see a, a variety of um, titles that we have available to you as state employees that you can check out from the State Library regarding anxiety and anxiety awareness. And here's another set here. There's a lot of good resources contingent upon what um, your current situation may be. There may be a specific resource that may be better for you than another. Um, another page, again, just going to try to go through these real quickly. Another page, PTSD. Again, breaking it down by the types of um, different types of anxiety that Zach talked about today. Um, there's also DVDs available in our collection. Uh, here's a few of them listed here, one on OCD, one on PTSD, and just a general one on anxiety disorders. So let's talk a little bit real quick about how you can find materials here at KDLA. There's two ways. Um, our uh, catalog, World Cat Discovery, I'm sure several of you have used it in the past. If you have difficulty searching the catalog or need help finding a resource, please give us a call at the reference desk and I'll give you that information at the end of the training. Also, you have access to Kentucky Libraries Unbound, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that and the catalog as well. From our homepage, kdla.ky.gov, you can see on the right-hand side there, you can click the link for the KDLA catalog. This brings you to the main search page. Right here is where you will type in the resources that you may or may not be interested in. You might find some you like, some you don't. That's the way it works with the library catalog world. Um, here's a resource on anxiety disorder, an essential resource for parents who may be dealing with adolescents that might have an anxiety concern. If there's a resource you want to check out, you will click on that resource and it will bring you into the sign-in page. You will add in your uh, library card information. If you do not know that information, again, you can contact us at the State Library and we'll help you get it. So here it's telling me that I want to go ahead and place a hold on this particular resource and they'll click Submit. And uh, I am the next hold in the queue, or Charlie was at the time. She's the one who set up these slides. So this uh, resource could be sent directly to you at your office. Um, we can take care of getting that to you. Kentucky Libraries Unbound, again, under the State Employees tab on the KDLA website, there's a page uh, informational page on downloading audiobooks and ebooks. This information will help you if you've never done it before. It gives you all the information on how to get started. It also gives you the direct link to Kentucky Libraries Unbound. Here's a, what the Kentucky Libraries Unbound homepage looks like. There is a search box on the top right hand side to look for uh, materials out of that collection that may be of value to you. Here's a couple more services that we offer here to, at KDLA for you as state employees, Interlibrary Loan and Ask a Librarian. We can get materials for you that are work-related. If we don't have them in our collection, we're happy to get them from other libraries for you. We also have our general Ask a Librarian uh, information form where we can help you with research for your, for your job. And again, to find Ask a Librarian under the State Employees tab, just click on the Ask a Librarian, and that will um, lead you to the, the form to fill out. Once again, I want to say thank you to everyone for attending with us here today. I am going to go ahead and uh, put the uh, downloads file up for all the information that was included today. Information for contacting Zach at KEEP is on here, as well as contacting us at the State Library. We're going to go ahead and close for now. If you've got any other questions, we'll deal with them in just a minute. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, I had, go ahead. I had somebody ask a question about PTSD related to carnival rides. Yeah. And yeah, and I, um, I think, yes, that would be applicable. I mean, if you... The way PTSD, the way the, the way the criteria is described is that if you find yourself in a situation where your physical integrity is at risk, like you are at risk of dying or being seriously injured or saw someone else close to die or be seriously injured, then, um, uh, and, and then have, uh, you know, uh, there's a, there's a, there's three categories under PTSD. One is intrusive thoughts. And one is the physical symptoms that we talked about, and then one is the avoidance behaviors. So if you see yourself having thoughts related to any type of ride or seeing you know, a TV show with Disney World on there or something like that, and it causes the physiological symptoms uh, that become then uh, overwhelming, and then you, know, you, have, um, you, you make choices to avoid watching TV shows that may have commercials or you definitely don't go anywhere near an amusement park or something like that, then yes, I mean, that could be what looks like a PTSD diagnosis, sure. 
we're going to go ahead and cl close off our recording now at this point because we are right at 11 o'clock. But again, Zach and I will go ahead and hang out for a few minutes to answer any other questions.